Hey, what's going on, guys? So we're here with Dr. Matthew Nagra, and we're going to be responding to Sean Baker's response to his response to Sean Baker's debate he had with Garth Davis recently on the same Carnivore YouTube channel, which Dr. Matthew Nagra had with Anthony Chafee. So it's a seven minute video and there was a lot to cover. So we're going to get right into it. And just a fair warning, there will be a lot of pausing just because there's a lot of things to cover. And Nagra, you have anything to say before we get right into it? Nope, I think we're good to go. All righty, sounds good. All right, guys, let's get into it. All right, um, here's a little video of a guy named Dr. Nagra, Nagra, something like that, apparently he debated. Dr. Chafee a while ago, and he had a, a little critique of my recent quote-unquote discussion, debate, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> with Dr. Garth Brooks, and here's what he has to say. Debate between vegan doctor Garth Davis and carnivore doctor Sean Baker. I don't know. I, I, I will say I don't know if, if my diet is going to make somebody live longer. I don't know if it's going to either prevent or increase the likelihood of some disease because we just don't have the data that shows that. As one of the biggest proponents of a carnivore diet, Sean clearly states that he actually doesn't know if this is going to lead to good or poor health outcomes in the long term. I would argue that it's likely to increase risk of colorectal cancer and cardiovascular disease compared to many diets out there just based on prior research on red meat. But what I really want to focus on here is that he still recommends it despite not even knowing if it'll be healthy in the long term. And he continuously puts out information like this and this and this and this. I can keep going. Okay, I'll stop after this. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pause this here because notice this um, tweet here. We're gonna be focusing on it a bit throughout this response only because Sean Baker at certain points speaks later in the video about how a lot of his social media is for entertainment. He even makes it sound like it's all for entertainment. And we have claims like this where he says in capital letters, red meat does not cause heart disease. And then we have a link to a study. Yeah, and it's the Nutrarex uh, papers, uh, which, I mean, you can link Avi's long debunk of that if, if anyone wants to watch it, but mm -hmm. it's uh, it's also observational research. So keep that in mind as well. He's citing that to suggest that red meat does not cause heart disease. All caps, very direct in that statement. I don't know how you can misinterpret that. Yeah, and the reason why Niagara is pointing out that it's observational is because on many occasions, Sean Baker has said that epidemiological research is not science in his view it's garbage so there's just a lot of confusion here and as you'll see in this video again he's going to talk about how all this is for entertainment purposes but how else are we supposed to interpret something like this especially his followers who look at him as an authority figure and take his word for it you know we all know that influencers have some kind of influence quite literally on their fans so i don't know who saw this tweet who's a big fan of his and was like ha 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 so funny so funny i'm not going to take this as like an actual accurate causal claim mm -hmm. yeah let's just keep going this one so he puts this out on social media presumably to suggest that a carnivore diet may be healthy or at the very least that red meat isn't unhealthy but later in the debate suggests that his social media is just for entertainment it's one of your more recent videos here um and you don't need to go <laughs> into right. like a so full i'll thing just put the caveat was, but the, I the, the social media is kind of for entertainment purposes only in many ways you know i mean i'm but anyway what am i saying here i don't know what's but my big issue with that is that there's no way he doesn't know that people are going to take what he says and actually implement it into their lifestyle. So this is a message to those who follow him and actually incorporate the information he provides into their lifestyle. He clearly states that he doesn't know if this will be healthy long term and it may actually be very unhealthy despite what he says on social media. And you can bet that he will not be held accountable if you follow his advice and end up suffering a heart attack. Okay, my response can to we this pause that for a sec? Yeah. Uh, one thing I just want to mention is that I had people, probably because they saw uh, Sean's video here, uh, they cut, came over to my pages and were like, well, you deceptively edited it or you took stuff out of context. Actually, if you include more context around those claims, it becomes even more clear that the way I was interpreting it is likely correct, at least based on how he meant it in that instance. In fact, I asked, well, I wouldn't say every single one because I kind of stopped looking at comments after a while, but for those first you know, 24 hours or so, I asked every single one of these people, can you point out what I left out, direct quotes, be specific, and I didn't have a single person actually provide that. So I, I just want to be clear, like that was not taken out of context. Um, and I, I know, Danny, I shared some clips with you earlier today that just like add further context oh, yeah. to, to what he was saying, you know, and, and it's pretty darn clear. Yeah, and hopefully you aren't given the same criticism with this video because we're going through his entire response. Uh, yeah, so, absolutely. You know, Although I suspect we, we still may, who knows. First thing he says that I said, I don't know the long-term outturn of a carnivore diet. 
which is true. I don't think anyone does. I, but I mean, I think I could extend that to really any diet out there, you know, and it is the absolute height of arrogance. Wait, can you pause that again? Yep, yep. Yeah. So, so he says that I said he doesn't know the uh, effects of a, you know, long term or the long term effects of a carnivore diet and then says that's true and says nobody knows. So I just want to also make clear that what I said again is presumably a correct interpretation of what he said. Now, um, he's going to change sort of the context here a little bit, and we'll we'll get into um, why, you know, I have some issues with that, but you can go ahead and play it. Yeah, gotcha. Say that you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, what something will happen down the road in all populations and all situations. Again, I, I reportedly, I mean, I repeatedly make the point okay, that- pause it. Mm -hmm. So he brings this up a lot. He he tries to paint this picture as though I'm saying I know absolute with absolute certainty the outcome of a given diet or dietary practice in all situations all the time. I've never claimed that. I am actually pretty measured in a lot of the claims that I make. Um, the terminology, the statistics I present. You know, I won't say something will lead to X outcome. I'll say you know there's a 17% uh, increased risk of X outcome or something like that. I also typically present the background information, like the demographic, for example, in a given study, uh, what factors were adjusted for to provide context to those findings. So this actually goes to show that Sean actually is not familiar with the content I put out, and he's sort of painting me as the absolutist uh, one here and, and the, mm -hmm. uh, the one that lacks nuance, when, um, if anything, I'd su suggest the reverse is probably more true. And also... He's now he's kind of switched from the idea that we don't know the long term outcomes of a carnivore diet to we don't know in all situations and so on. OK, what situations do we know the long term outcomes? That would be my question. Do you have evidence for that? And I mean, he's already said and if you watch again more of the debate, he makes very clear that there is simply no good long term evidence of a carnivore diet, period. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I just want to really address that. And we're probably going to hammer that same point several times throughout the next you know several minutes here yeah and just to be clear you never claim that you know with absolute certainty yeah. the long-term implications of every single diet in every situation ever all you did was mm -hmm. point out the irresponsibility of promoting something like the carnivore diet while not knowing the long-term implications of it that doesn't in any way suggest that you know everything or have absolute knowledge about every sort of uh, nutritional based proposition out there you know yeah, all I'm making is an inference based on prior data. We have prior data on red meat consumption. I know he has some qualms with that. We'll get into that. And we have you know, prior research on other foods, fruits, veggies, etc. And we can make reasonable inferences on the risks of completely leaving all of that out. So um, it, that's all it is. Even mm -hmm. in the case of, of some gold standard, which he's going to highlight later on, we don't know anything with absolute certainty. It would just point us in that direction. So uh, we'll... we'll just go from here. I think we can play it and see what comes up next. Yeah, I will say, I mean, you could respond to when he said, um, we don't know the long term outcomes of any diet. Oh, yeah, want, I should. You know, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. let, let me let me talk yeah. about that. So I don't know what he did, you know, calls long term. Later on, he talks about 50 year randomized controlled trials, which is ridiculous. And again, we'll touch more on that when he brings it up. But we have like nearly three decade long follow up from some cohorts on like red meat consumption, say the nurses health study and health professionals follow up study. Um, and that's where they've continuously evaluated dietary intake throughout. So it's not like they just assess dietary intake in the beginning and then followed people. It's like, no, you, you know whether or not they're changing their intake along the way or if they've been pretty consistent with it. Uh, we also have dietary uh, quality measures in that cohort for a similar length of time, like the plant based diet index. We have long term randomized controlled trials. And by long term, I mean, you know, you know five years or so, roughly uh, it's a little bit less, a little bit more. Um, not a ton of them because they're really difficult to conduct and uh, very expensive. But we have some. Um, and then we have data on every stage of life. We have data on dietary patterns and pregnancy outcomes. We have data on dietary patterns and the risk of, say, frailty in the elderly and everywhere in between. So um, you can put that together to, again, make pretty reasonable inferences about um, cause and effect. Yeah, and to uh, be clear, with to apps, be clear, yeah. yeah, to be clear, not like I know for a million percent fact that it is going <laughs> to yeah. be the case. It's like when in like philosophy, when people get into like what's what I think some have called the skeptic sphere, where we're in the territory of like, how do I even know that my mom is conscious or that I even exist? Like that's not the level of certainty we're looking for. That's what it's weird that it, that he made it seem like that's what you're asking for. It's not that you want that level. You just want like some some level, some reasonable level. 
and that's it you know there, there's no implication on your part that you have all the knowledge or like have some sort of absolute answer to whether to the long-term effects of any diet so i, I don't know why mm. he went there with that a carnivore population a population of meat heavy eaters who do not eat junk food that do not eat significant carbohydrates is a very different population and we have no way of telling what the long-term outcomes of what those what those patients may or may not be now you can infer and try to make your best guesses based on highly confounded studies where you conflate a McDonald's eating, you know, meat eater to a carnivore. I just don't think that's an appropriate extrapolation of the data. There's, there's a couple things there. So he's saying that you can't extrapolate this data to carnivores. Um, and I would say you can't directly, but again, you can reasonably infer there's a linear dose response between red meat consumption and outcomes like cardiovascular disease, total mortality. Um, unless I made a video about this before, unless the risk goes up and then all of a sudden falls off a cliff for whatever reason, um, you can reasonably infer that there's probably risk there. Um, now, he talks about highly confounded studies, and he obviously talking about observational research, but that's exactly what he cited in that tweet where he says, um, red meat does not cause heart disease, all caps. So why is he citing it in that case, unless that is presumably some kind of joke meme content tweet? I don't know. Um, but why would you you cite that in that way if that is just highly confounded, essentially useless, you know, based on his. And even if work. it was considered that type of content. Yeah. Do you not expect your followers to exactly. take it seriously, you know? Yeah. And, and, and just to talk about confounders for a second, you know, if we look at uh, this analysis that I often cite uh, by Zong, this was published, I think, 2019. Um, you can link it below, show it on the screen. Even yeah. if you look at the adjustment models, like the amount that is considered in this is is ridiculous. There's age, sex, race, um, educational level. Uh, I'm just reading off of here. As far as diet, there's total calorie intake. Um, there's fruits, vegetables, legumes, uh, potatoes separate from vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole grains, um, refined grains, low fat dairy, high fat dairy, sugar sweetened beverages, eggs. Uh, and then uh, if they're looking at the unprocessed red meat finding, then they're adjusting for processed meat, poultry and fish, or vice versa, depending on the specific finding. And then they also adjust for smoking, exercise, alcohol intake, hormone replacement therapy. What else is there that would have a meaningful effect that would explain the results, um, if not for some of those variables? Because what they're essentially doing in this adjustment model, and I'm not saying it's absolutely perfect, but they're essentially equalizing those variables. And they're trying to see what is the independent effect of the red meat. Um, now, they also went further um, and they subgrouped by diet quality. So he talks about, you know, McDonald's eating versus um, like, I guess, steak eating or, or whatever he would uh, prefer. Um, they subgrouped by those eating a higher or lower uh, overall quality diet. And actually, the results are most, most clear in those with a higher diet quality. So the risks of red meat show up most clearly in those with a higher quality diet. Why might that be? Well, if you have a low diet quality the red meat is likely replacing something not very healthy. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it is some ultra processed foods. And also diet's only gonna have so much of an effect. It's not a panacea um, as much as, as Sean seems to, to think that I present it as. It's really not. And so um, once you've had a very poor quality diet, adding some red meat isn't gonna do too much. But if you have a high quality diet, whether you're adding red meat or whether you're adding in sugar sweetened beverages or some other food that is generally not super healthy for us, you're gonna see it show up more in that context. That doesn't mean that the high quality diet with red meat is worse than a low quality diet without red meat. It just means that all else held equal, the red meat is likely not so good for us. You know, these are the kind of nuanced areas that I, it just doesn't seem that he's all that familiar with or, or hasn't really looked at. Yeah, and just to be clear, I'm gonna say this a bunch of times that nothing you said suggests that you think this evidence is like absolute proof of anything. It's just it's yeah. suggestive, strongly suggestive and better than, uh, it puts you in a position to not say something like, I just don't know, you know what I mean? When promoting something yeah, yeah. like the carnivore yeah, diet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we make assessments, good or bad, about how long a carnivore diet will last over the long term. In a point of that debate, if you listen to the full debate, I say that in the short term, we see extremely good results and no one is out there saying that uh, you know, you shouldn't go on this medication because we don't know what the long-term results might be. You know, there's people who take proton pump inhibitors or people who take statins or people who take blood pressure medications. Can you pause it before we get into yeah. all the medication stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we get into the medication, I just want to point out that 
I understand he mentioned that there, you know, some people anecdotally experience benefits in the short term. You find that for any dietary practice, including the Twinkie diet. Look at Mark Hobb. He did that. He felt better. He lost weight and so on. That doesn't mean that it's beneficial long term. People can see improvements in the short term on a, um, uh, you know, by smoking even as far mm -hmm. as uh, appetite suppression. Um, there are certain conditions where there's actually research suggesting it can improve symptoms of things like ulcerative colitis and so on. Mm -hmm. But when you when you actually weigh the risks and the benefits, it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty clear picture that you, know, you probably shouldn't smoke. Yeah. Um, there are other ways to treat these issues. And so um, I wasn't denying that. Plus, when we go back to all the tweets of his that I showed of him making claims about nutrition, they were uh, cardiovascular disease. They were related to life expectancy. Uh, I think there might have been one in there related to mental health. I can't remember. But generally speaking, these are long-term outcomes. We mm -hmm. weren't looking at short-term outcomes. And th this is coming from him, right? He's tweeting these things. So mm -hmm. this idea that um, we should ignore all of that, the long-term stuff, even though he talks about it himself, is just, I think, a bit ridiculous. It it's sort of a, a red herring in this case. Yeah. And, uh, I totally understand why finding something that works for you in the short term. And I, and by the way, we both agree that, yeah, people do probably experience short term relief when they do something like the carnivore diet, but you can't just look at the short term to determine it's, it's okay. Like someone with Crohn's disease, like me, I can literally starve myself for like two or three days if I do like a water fast or something and I feel a lot better, but we all know that starving yourself in the long term is, is a bad thing, right? Not to, not to say that Sean is making the claim that we have these short term uh, outcomes therefore it's fine he's not making the claim at all but it's also important to just think of all the other things that are good in the short term that we know in the long term are not right yeah i just don't see the point of bringing that up here because that right. wasn't what we were talking about we were clearly talking about long-term outcomes um and also right. i'll just mention in the short term you can't verify these anecdotes you, you can't control for other you know confounders if you look at carnivore cringe on instagram um, yeah, yeah you know there's a thousand a thousand negative anecdotes there mm -hmm. you look at even people who followed a carnivore diet uh long term paul saladino he actually felt better once he incorporated more carbs frank tofano now denounces the carnivore diet carnivore kid had a 95 percent uh blockage in his left uh lad his uh widowmaker artery as it's often um called uh 50 plus beauty on youtube suffered a stroke uh, while on the carnivore diet. And that's not to say that the carnivore diet caused any of these issues. I'm not going to make a causal claim based on anecdotes. I'm just saying there's also reason to be skeptical. There are clearly people, at least on that diet, having negative outcomes, and those often get ignored. Yeah, the results or this standard of evidence just goes in both directions. That's the main point yeah. being made right yeah. here. And yeah, I would totally understand why somebody would be motivated to hope and want the long-term health outcomes of a diet that it brings them short-term relief to be good. But the fact is that we just don't have that. And of course, Sean acknowledges that, but we're just trying to point out that bringing up the short term here is just like, I don't know, it's kind of, it's irrelevant to their criticism in the first place, which is about him not knowing the long-term implications of the carnivore diet. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. And uh, I think we're good to move on, but maybe rewind a tiny bit because we're kind of in the middle of the medication yeah. claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The point of that debate, if you listen to the full debate, I say that in the short term, we see extremely good results and no one is out there saying that. Uh, you know, you shouldn't go on this medication because we don't know what the long-term results might be. You know, there's people who take proton pump inhibitors or people who take statins or people who take blood pressure medications, on and on and on. There's so many medications we do. We put people on chronically for a particular reason, knowing that the, the long-term data is at best unknown, right? So no one, has, no one has any qualms about doing that within the entire field of medicine. And to sit there and suggest that, well, because we don't have long-term 50-year trials of randomized trials on carnivore is therefore not a reason for anyone to do it you know i'm not so with the medications it, that that was honestly pretty bizarre i think so um for starters in order for drugs to make it to market like let's talk about things like statins or, or blood pressure meds as he brought up mm -hmm. um, they go through quite a rigorous process you have preclinical data in say animal models uh, and this is after you have you know uh, you speculated kind of around the potential mechanisms that that may work uh, you have preclinical data then you have phase one these are small human trials uh phase two trials slightly larger phase three trials generally very large, um, oftentimes several thousands of people. And then you'll follow them long term, actually looking at clinical endpoints. So for something like statins, you're not just looking at does it lower cholesterol, you're looking at does it lower the risk of having a heart attack, right? So prior to this making it to market, 
it's been shown to reduce that clinical endpoint. And you're typically having several thousands upon thousands of people in these trials. Now, if there's a some unknown side effect that shows up after very long-term chronic use, which that doesn't happen very often, um, or there is a side effect that's so rare that it doesn't show up in these trials with thousands upon thousands of people, then chances are the risks are a lot lower than the risk of having a heart attack, which has already been shown to prevent or help prevent, right? So mm -hmm. um, in that case, yeah, it's pretty reasonable to take that to market because it's already been shown to very likely be life-saving. Now, at the same time, then you have post-market surveillance. You actually monitor these drugs for several years um, to, to track you know, any, anything that does happen to come up uh, you know, way down, down the line several years later, or um, if there is something that's perhaps just very rare that you only pick up uh, when you know, millions of people are taking it. Mm -hmm. And actually, to, to say that we don't have long-term data, if he means at this point, I mean, we have decades of data on, on something like statins. For example, we have a 20-year follow-up on uh, kids who were given statins because they have familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is during years of more rapid development as well, and actually shows that it reduces the progression of plaque formation um, and reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease compared to their uh, their parents who did not have these medications around when they were that age, uh, who also had familial uh, hypercholesterolemia. We also have post-market data or post-trial data on 32,000 people who were given blood pressure meds. So this is like 23 years later. Um, monitoring yeah, for side I, effects and efficacy. Like I, this, this is yeah. this idea that we push drugs out there without data is just insane. Honestly, like it, that is yeah. ridiculous. Also, I just want to say he said. I think I have the quote here. Nobody has qualms about medication being promoted without long term evidence. It's like they do. No, that's do. that's why the the trials are done because people are worried about the long term effects. So it's a bit weird exactly. to bring up something like medication as a parallel to the carnivore diet as though both don't have long-term evidence supporting them when really one of them does. So uh, I don't know why he thought to bring up medication. Yeah, I found that to be one of the odder like comments of the whole thing. It's very clear that, that we do have uh, long-term data. And in fact, we had at least data looking at hard endpoints prior to them making them to market in the first place. Right. We don't have long-term 50-year trials of randomized trials on carnivore is therefore not a reason for anyone to do it, you know? I'm not in there suggesting that everybody in the world should do it, first of all. I'm saying in select cases, there are people that tremendously benefit from this strategy, and I will continue to maintain. I mean, you never said that he said that everybody should yeah. do it. You know, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure why he said that yeah. either. Well, th there's a couple things there. So for mm -hmm. one, it, it, you know, if you're saying select people benefit, so to speak, how do you determine who's gonna benefit and who isn't? Or do you just put everyone on it and hope? Right. Like, like that's a big part of the problem here. If you're claiming that some people benefit, well, how can you show that certain people are more likely to benefit than others? I mean, and we've already talked about how um, all they have right now is the short term benefits. So if you're looking exactly. at just short term benefits to determine if it's good for them, but we're talking about long term outcomes, I don't know how the short term can inform on the long term. Like, you know what I mean? Unless exactly. unless yeah. like a risk factor that we know is long term associated with uh, some bad outcome, for example, like uh, LDL going up in the short term we know that it's like a risk factor associated with cardiovascular disease going like risk of that going up so that's an example but that's not what is happening here for him i feel like it's more symptom relief and things like yeah, that yeah it's symptom you know? relief and then he talks about like weight loss and stuff being risk factors for cardiovascular yeah. disease and i agree yeah that's true is. Yeah. but you're you're essentially trading risk factors in a lot of ways so how do you mm. know the net result like you have to follow this stuff you know, you know, follow people kind of doing this for quite a period of time before you actually make recommendations. People doing it of their own accord, ideally not not being influenced by, you know, influencers online and, and then people pushing this idea. Mm -hmm. Now, this idea of 50 year trials, this is a huge one. And I think he kind of shoots himself in the foot with this and we'll get to more of why in a bit. But if that's what he thinks we need in order to make a claim about long term effects, we we don't have 50 year randomized control trials on smoking, on exercise, on processed foods, which he later suggests is, is a problem, and he actually highlighted a bunch in the debate, is a problem. How does he come to this idea that exercise causes, ideally, you know, uh, better outcomes, and that things like you know, smoking or processed foods cause or are likely to cause poorer outcomes? There's some sort of threshold with the data that those have met that 
is really what a carnivore diet should have to meet or what red meat, the data on red meat should have to meet for him to accept that. Otherwise, he's holding just bizarre, bizarrely different standards, really. Um, if you require a 50 year RCT for carnivore, but you accept this other stuff based pretty much exclusively on observational data, if we're looking at the long term clinical endpoint. So that it just doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense. And, and this is this is something that we really need to hammer home. And, and actually going back to when he said that the data I cited is highly confounded, not that he pointed out any specifics, confounding is a causal concept. So what I mean by that, if you say that the association between red meat and cardiovascular disease is confounded by people eating red meat, I don't know, being more likely to smoke, mm -hmm. not exercising as much, mm -hmm. even though we adjust for those variables. So, I mean, it's kind of a non-issue anyway. But if we were to say that, he needs to show that those variables lead to that outcome, that they cause that outcome. And whatever threshold that has to be met for causal inference is all we'd have to meet for red meat. And I very highly doubt he can find a substantial difference um, or point out a substantial difference between the threshold that you need for, say, processed meat and the threshold you would need for red meat. He shouldn't be able to, or I don't think he'll be able to point out the difference in the available data as it pertains to meeting that threshold for either processed meat, or sorry, processed foods or red meat. Right, because if you're going to talk about these things as confounds, you're going to need, in his view, what it seems like is 50-year RCTs yeah. to consider them confounds or something that are causal with some certain outcome we're looking for to be caused by yeah. a different variable in some in some study so it's a bit odd that that seems to be his criteria for inferring causality when we all know that there's not there's no rcts on 50 year rcts on processed food smoking etc but he still looks at them as as something that we should uh recommend people don't do which he i think i believe he mentions at the end of this video too so yeah exactly that's yeah. why i brought it up now but we'll, we'll get back to yeah. it yeah um you know it is the height of arrogance to say that the science is settled to me that is the most insane yeah you never said that i mean at, at all at, all you didn't in your i mean you did a lot of things in your video but the, the main point you were putting forward was that it's a bit irresponsible, very irresponsible to promote a diet which you don't know the long-term health outcomes for. Yeah, where you openly do not know the long-term outcomes mm -hmm. of. And um, and when it came to red meat, I just said I would suggest that it would likely increase risk based on our prior data. Like I was very intentional with that language. I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not saying like you eat red meat, you're gonna have a heart attack. No, that, I can't even say that about smoking. You yeah. can't say if you smoke, you're gonna get lung cancer. No, right. but we know that it increases your risk substantially. Um, and so I would recommend against smoking. You know, and, and because the data points towards red meat being problematic for, for certain outcomes, I would generally recommend limiting that. I'm not saying even that you need to completely exclude it to be healthy, but definitely limiting. And generally, you know, a couple times a week, once a week is is fine when it comes to health outcomes. Um, obviously, there are other reasons, environmental, ethical, and so on, that people may choose to go even less or none. But for health, like I'm, I'm very measured. And I, I don't think this is the type of, of terminology some like biased, crazy vegan would be putting out there, you know, as it right. pertains to this topic. Right. Um, you know, it is the height of arrogance to say that the science is settled. To me, that is the most unscientific arrogant religious thing you can possibly say you know when it comes to science and so if this if it, if it is his opinion that the data is unequivocally irrefutably a certain way for all not your opinion at all i don't know why yeah, this yeah. Is being so said. Just, just to be clear just to be clear i never said it was my whole point was that he is not certain about the long-term implications of his dietary recommendations and that is why it's irresponsible to promote it and to be clear, That's not and when you, when you say the word certain, you don't mean absolutely certain yeah, for yeah, every yeah, single yeah. Well, person. Some degree ever. of certain. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Some degree of certainty. And like, yeah, we, we don't need to know the result, the absolute, you know, correct result for every single person, or what would actually happen for every single individual person. We can make inferences based on the data. Yeah, I mean, as far as like probabilities, that's all it is. It's would, you, would you say it's fair to say you'd want some kind of level of certainty, like the certainty we have with exercising and smoking or something like that in terms I mean, of... I mean, like, I don't even think we need that mm -hmm. level of, so like, especially mm -hmm. with something like smoking um, yeah. in particular, I don't think we need that level of certainty, but there is a certain threshold mm -hmm. that you'd like to meet. So um, having, for one, <laughs> any long-term data would be a start. But having prospective cohorts, for example, that adjust for compounding variables um, as best we can, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully in different populations, uh, yeah. hopefully long enough, uh, long term enough to identify 
hard endpoints like cardiovascular disease in a population that may be uh, um, kind of in the age range that you'd expect those to come up. Like there are certain things that we'd like to see um, or I'd like to see. Uh, and even some like shorter term RCTs looking at certain biomarkers like that can add to the 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 picture as well. Like there, there's a few things that could help here. But to push the diet without any of that, like literally any of it, that's irresponsible in my view. Right. Populations in all sit situations, then that is completely misleading and, and BS in my view. Now, the second point he makes. Well, that's is not that, that's not my position. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I said the social media is for entertainment and, and absolutely it is. You know, the videos of me. So absolutely it is. Now he's going to add context here, but I just want to be clear. I'm not sure how else him saying social media is for entertainment only is to be taken any other way than I took it. Right. Like I'm really not sure how you can interpret that in a different way in the context that it was presented. Lauren just said, you posted a video recently. He has no idea what it's about. He doesn't know if it's informative. He doesn't know if it's one of these like steak eating videos and he automatically goes into like a chuckle and then, well, you know, social media is for entertainment purposes only. And then she brings up a video where he's talking about a study and he goes on to talk about that. Not once does he say, oh no, this video I was actually serious about. It's those other videos that I was joking about. So mm -hmm. this seems almost like like he's backtracking a little bit, if I had to kind of read into it. Right. And again, there's that tweet that I'll put on the screen right now. I, I don't know how we're supposed to ex view this as entertainment. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. you're making a causal claim with the and you're setting a meta analysis yeah, with the causal exactly, claim. Exactly. So, yeah. Or some wackos doing something crazy. That is for that's for laughs and yucks to get more attention. So that the, the underlying message that I have is, and, and my message isn't just eat more meat. It's exercise, get leaner. So let's just say, just let's just grant this that that was it was misinterpreted. Whatever he didn't express it uh, the way that he wanted to. Let's just grant for a second that he was specifically talking about those kind of jokey steak eating videos he posts. Okay, that's fine. Let's put that aside. Now let's address the actual nutritional claims that you make, like red meat does not cause heart disease, like the carnivore diet is you know, presumably healthy as he kind of pushes it. Let's address those. It's still a problem, whether it's for entertainment or not. You know? or, yeah, or the video like, that Lauren put on the screen, exactly, which was him going into a study. Like, was that just supposed to be, was that a comedy bit? Like, I'm not, I'm not really sure. It's very yeah, confusing. But, but like, what, what I'm saying is even if that was, even if we accept that, okay, there, there's a time and a place where he's being a jokester. There's a time and a place where he's being serious. When he's being serious, let's address those claims. Right. For, forget about the, the jokey stuff. Mm -hmm. It's still problematic whether or not it's for entertainment. Again, I, I think I interpreted it in the only way you could really interpret it at the mm -hmm. time. But we can just grant that and still there's an issue here. Yeah. And he said his underlying message is exercise and, you know, eat, don't yeah. eat processed foods. But you, you don't have 50 year trials for that yeah. yet you do it yeah it's almost like How sean under that conclusion yeah it's almost like sean understands the kind of certainty we're looking for yeah. in the case of processed foods and exercise but for the carnivore diet but when we make this sort of criticism he acts like what we're looking for is something insanely absolute when that's yeah. not what we're looking for we're looking for the same level of confidence you have or something similar even even less like you said like what we have for processed foods and exercise so yeah I, I, like i, I think I think drawing a, a, you know, a parallel to processed or ultra processed foods in particular is a great one to draw. And in fact, when you actually break down ultra processed foods into the different types of ultra processed foods, there's really only a, a couple that are very consistently associated with poor outcomes, at least based on recent data. But even mm -hmm. then, like if you're to look at the data on those foods, sugar sweetened beverages, let's say, I think we can, I think Sean and I can agree that Coca Cola is not good for you. What data would Sean cite to support the position? that sugar sweetened beverages are harmful. Now, how is that data more compelling than the data on red meat and right. similar outcomes? That right. would be my question to him. And I really don't know if he could provide, well, I mean, he certainly can't provide 50 year RCTs, so let's be real, but I, I don't think he could really provide a, a, a um, evidence of there being like a huge difference in the way that those studies are conducted, what they're looking at, what they're adjusting for and so on. Mm -hmm. Don't be sedentary, don't eat processed food on and all. On. Also, the sedentary, like, do you have 50 year RCTs yeah. on like you don't, but you still have some level yeah. of confidence in why avoiding sed being sedentary is a good thing. That's what we're kind of looking for with the promotion of the carnivore diet. And on and on these things. It's not like I'm saying sit on your ass, get fat, eat lots of meat, you know, eat lots of saturated. Fat I never did. Meat. I never I never assumed that. I never said that. So yeah, I don't even know why, why this is being brought up in the first place. Yeah. Anyways. Anyway, I've, 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 anybody who's listened to me 
uh, knows that's not true. And, and to sit there and conflate <laughs> that what, because I have some goofy stuff on social media for I didn't conflate anything. Yeah. I did not conflate anything. I took it in the context it was presented. Mm-hmm. Just because let's be let's be honest if you just sit there and dryly read studies all day long no one gives a fuck right <laughs> no one's gonna no one's gonna pay attention to that stuff so you have to do something to yeah i mean to be fair i mean like your your content is largely reading off important findings of studies and and what you deem uh, important parts of the methodology etc and you, you're quite successful online so i mean i mean i mean let, let, let's be clear i'm nowhere near i don't have anywhere near the reach of someone like sean yeah, but yeah uh but uh, you know i mean uh, it's it's like a, a hobby it's a side gig i provide like free information on new studies and stuff you know mm-hmm. um but even so it's like well you you can still make stuff entertaining while providing good information like you right. can do that that's possible um there are other accounts that do that and actually speaking to myself about my own content you know i used to really aim for i want to do that 60 seconds so i can be a youtube short or a reel back when the limit was 60 seconds but i've actually expanded that and i don't even care about the time limit anymore if i need to go longer to include all the important details i do mm-hmm. um like because i want to make sure that i put the really important information you know like what was adjusted for what sort of demographic are we looking at? A little bit about the study mm-hmm. design, et cetera. Um, so it's like, yeah, I, I understand the the whole kind of clickbaity nature of social media, but I think there's a bit of a responsibility to to provide mm-hmm. a little bit more context. Yeah, All right. Engage your audience, and that's one thing that I do do. And it's funny, you know, sometimes this is fun. Have, what the hell, just have some fun with this stuff. And the other thing is accountability. You know. Am I going to be accountable for someone having a heart attack? Well, let me ask you a question. Is, is Dr. Nagra telling every vegan to go get a bone density Pause that. test? He didn't answer his own question, right? He just responded to the um, the comment about accountability by saying, am I accountable? And then shifting it to me right. rather than actually addressing that. So I just want to point that out, but we can finish what yeah. he's saying here. Uh-huh. Test every five years because we know vegan diets, or at least we think we know vegan diets, are more likely to cause fractures. I don't hear... Do you want to comment on the yeah, language yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, yeah so... Notice how he said, we know that a vegan diet, and then he walked it back. And if I had to guess, again, this is just speculation, had this whole thing not been about him presenting information the way that he does, I actually don't know if he would have walked it back. I actually Mm -hmm. wonder if he would have just said, we know that this is fact. Uh, But that being said, let's be be charitable. Um, He says, okay, we think we know. How do we think we know? Because there's been two or three cohort studies published, observational research published, suggesting that there's a higher risk of fracture, particularly in women. This has not been seen in... Uh, men. Also, oh, actually to, to point out, again, not a 50-year RCT. Mm-hmm. Um, so he doesn't have that threshold here, at least to say that he thinks he knows something. Um, Two levels of certainty as, there. It's like knowing something yeah. absolutely or thinking we know, right? Yeah. And we obviously yeah. want him to be on the more like thinking we know yeah. side of that uh, coin, yeah. not absolutely. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. And then, you know, he's saying, am I going to be responsible if someone goes vegan and, and uh, uh, you know, ends up with poor bone health or whatever, or he says, do I tell people to get uh, BMD scans every five years? Well, actually, uh, once they're of age, yeah, that's in the guidelines to have bone marrow density scans regularly, regardless of dietary pattern. Now, there are certain there are certain risk factors that lead someone to getting scans earlier on, and that's obviously a discussion that would be had with a, a, a doctor kind of one-on-one, and you you'd sort out if, if you qualify. But also, I do actually talk about a lot. I've made several posts, three, maybe four posts on factors that are related to bone health, why this is actually important for vegans to consider and how to mitigate those risks. So adequate vitamin D, calcium, uh, maintaining a healthy weight as, as the fracture risk in the Epic Oxford uh, study in particular seems to largely be driven by a lower body weight uh, because of the, the adjustments were inadequate there. Um, so I actually do highlight the importance of this a lot. I, I don't hand wave it. I don't just ignore it. I see it. I want to understand why that is happening. And as data has accumulated, we do have a pretty good idea of what the driving factors are and we, how to mitigate that. And, and so I do talk about that a lot. And also, I'm not recommending something without any data. I, we have data. Um, and, and again, I want to be clear. I'm not like recommending stuff to, to people on, online, but at least in my practice, I recommend um, different things like, and I don't recommend a vegan diet specifically. I, w- I want to be very clear about that. I make recommendations based on what the evidence suggests. The, ch- the choice to go vegan is an ethical one. Obviously, some people will, will make the switch to a, a plant-exclusive diet for environmental reasons as well. But when it comes to health, I don't think there's much wrong with having a little bit of animal products in there. So I don't tell people they need to go vegan for their health. So I'm not recommending that per se. But, l- but let's just say for sake of argument that I do, 
yeah, there are certain things that I want to make sure that they're getting in their diet and that they're, you know, taking care for. And, and if there is, you know, if there are, sorry, other risk factors there mm -hmm. for related to bone health, then yeah, we would consider checking bone mineral density. Of yeah. course. Right. I hear him saying that. I don't hear any vegan saying, oh, you should surely check your uh, bone mineral density every five years to make sure your, your bones aren't decaying. And, and what am I saying? I'm saying if, if your cholesterol is high, by all means, go get some sort of imaging study, serially. Can you pause so it? You can... What imaging studies? Is he talking about coronary artery calcium scans that don't um, actually show calcification typically until old age after the plaque has been there for a very, very long time and it's not something you can necessarily reverse? Or is he telling people to get angiograms, which like nobody really has access to anyway, at least here in Canada, you're, you're not really going to get in for that uh, just to check. So he's not really comparing apples to apples here, at least doesn't seem like it uh, to yeah. me. So I don't know why he's trying to, to raise this point or, or trying to say that he is, you know, considering these risks, because oftentimes the first sign of, of a of an outcome is a heart attack. A lot of people don't don't know ahead of time. And, and that's sort of one of the big problems. Yes, you can get CAC scans, but that doesn't mean you're risk free. Um, in the MISA cohort, for example, I, I think it was something like a third, I, I could be off on the numbers a little bit, but something like a third of people with a CAC score of zero had plaque. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because a soft plaque won't show up. So I mean, these are things to really important things to consider. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And, and I, I, to be clear, I don't know if he's talking about CAC scans here, but I, I think he is just based on other stuff I've seen from him. Okay. Confirm or deny whether or not you're developing disease. I say that all the time. So, you know, uh, the, the whole thing of accountability. I mean, there's everybody on social media is telling you to do something. Is everybody accountable? Hell, I mean, Joe, Jit, uh, <laughs> Joe Rogan tells people jujitsu is a great thing. I went and did it. It hurt my neck. Am I going to sit there and sue Joe Rogan because I did jujitsu? Hell no. I mean, I, I understand the risks and the benefits. Yeah, so uh, it's just, that, yeah. Yeah, a little Go weird ahead. to compare something like a dietary intervention that can potentially harm you uh, many decades down the line to yeah. co a combat sport that we all know has an increased risk of of, of like yeah. injury. <laughs> like I, I don't know, it's kind of yeah. weird. And and to, on the point of should Joe Rogan be held accountable? I mean, for that, I, I'm I'm sh I've actually seen him comment on injuries and stuff and the risk of that. But um, that aside, if for a lot of the information he provides, especially around like um, uh, nutrition, a lot of the, the stuff that he puts out there, you know, the guests that he gets on and, and knowing the message that they share. Yeah, I think he should be held accountable. Um, mm -hmm. Is he? No. Will he be? Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in the perfect world, I think he should be because he's spreading stuff on one of the biggest platforms in the world that very impressionable people listen to. I think a lot of people would agree with that sentiment, sentiment that he should be accountable. Now, yeah, with combat sports, like, look, I've, I've competed in boxing, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I've actually trained with Hoist Gracie. I've done, I've got a black belt in Taekwondo. I've, I've done all tons of martial arts, wrestling tournaments. Never once have I gone into a tournament or heck, even a class and not signed a liability waiver because mm -hmm. we know there are risks. Right. Like, it is very well understood that there are risks. My problem with this carnivore stuff is that it, it, people are going into it thinking there are not risks. And again, how else do you interpret this comment, this tweet of red meat does not cause heart disease right. other than, oh, it is not going to increase my risk of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, it is safe for my heart. And obviously, you can extend that to, to other stuff that he's put out there around like life expectancy and whatnot. So people are going into it thinking there aren't risks, thinking there are pretty much exclusively benefits in a lot of cases, at least based on a lot of the comments that I get. Um, and that is where my problem is. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Sean did not go into jujitsu not understanding that there are some risks of injury right? Um, versus, you know, this. Mm -hmm. Benefits going into these things, or at least that there are risks. And if anybody is out there saying that I'm out here saying there is no risk and we know that it's absolutely safe and everybody should be doing this, that's absolutely... I mean, again, when you have those tweets, that one tweet that I, we keep showing it's like how else is somebody who's a big fan of you who views you as an authority on nutrition going to or supposed to interpret that you know what i mean exactly Big straw man yeah. garbage right and by the way i'm i'm more than happy to continue doing jujitsu i rehab my neck and i'm totally fine at this point but you know to have the arrogance to say that you know it all that you know i it don't all. i never said that yeah i, I don't i don't know why um it's you just wanting like some now. level of certainty yeah. Uh, or yeah. at least to the same degree or similar degree that we have for like processed food and exercise. Like, I don't know why we're wanting someone to have that when they're promoting something is to say that, you know, it all or, or whatever, like, you know, there's, it's not at all what you're, what you're saying. And it's not even like you're asking for that level of certainty. So, yeah. you know,
is, in my view, dangerous. That's more dangerous than anything I say where we say we don't. I mean, I think the honest answer, all of us should be saying we don't really know. And particularly in this instance, particularly in the context of a carnivore diet, what I would say that I think I think I can say with some level of at least more likelihood is not being obese, not being sedentary, not eating processed garbage is likely good for us. I think most of us would agree. Yeah, on pause that. it there. Yeah, yeah. That's all I want, right? With, as it pertains to to, well, we'll say red meat specifically, is what level of certainty do you have? that there is or is not risk? Uh, mm -hmm. Or um, what sort of level of certainty do you have as far as the data anyways, uh, you know, as it pertains to risk? So that's all I want. And I would say that as far as um, the evidence goes, it points towards there being risk, probably pretty substantial risk. But I'm not saying that with certainty, like absolute certainty. I'm saying it with some level of certainty as, as we have for things like yeah. all processed foods and whatnot. So, also, in, in the um, case and, of like uh, how you would describe as like, you want me to have evidence that it's beneficial for everyone? Like, we don't even have that yeah. for exercise. There's people where, no. where, where the exercise in a certain a scenario is actually a bad idea. Or there are situations in hospital where like, having very calorie dense processed foods might be, be life-saving, you know what I mean? So even for those things, we know that you can't just blankly say that exercise for every single person at every single moment in time is good for them, you know? And that's not what we're looking for with the carnivore diet either. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. And whether or not it's absolutely right for all people in all situations. Look, you just said it there. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't say with any degree of certainty, but what I will say is that, you know, that's a very different situation than saying it's someone who is eating meat and exercising and losing weight and putting disease into remission and has normal blood pressure. Normal. Also, the disease remission stuff, um, a lot of times in carnivore dieters, at least from what I've seen, uh, talk about this. They're referring to uh, inflammatory bowel disease where someone has either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And these diseases, and I, I have Crohn's disease. Um, not that my not that my having it means increases the truth value of what I'm about to say, but these diseases come in a, like a flare remission basis. You know, my first flare of Crohn's was when I was a meat eater, and it was there for like what, like a couple months or so, and then I went vegan a, a little bit later, was in remission, and then I got another flare while vegan uh, for six months, went away. I was in remission for six years. Am I going to sit here and be like the vegan diet cures Crohn's disease, or like cures a disease that literally? comes on a remission flare basis you know what i mean like it's just uh it's it's a bit silly to to infer that your uh diet is causing like long-term remission when similar to the heart disease stuff we don't have that kind of long-term data on mm -hmm. um incidence of remission and flaring with this diet etc so yeah yeah normal glucose and all those things is at extreme high risk due to consuming more saturated fat. I think that Pause is- Pause it. I never said extreme high risk. Now, I think there is substantial risk on a population level. I absolutely do. For each individual, am I gonna say that it automatically puts them at extremely high risk? I'm not sure how you would set the line for what's considered extreme, but mm -hmm. like, let's say their LDL cholesterol levels or ApoB levels drive up to uh, someone with with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia and mm -hmm. there's different forms but but we'll say like like very 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 high levels i would say yeah they're at very high risk of within two three decades having a, a cardiovascular event like very high risk mm -hmm. um now if their levels are, are say elevated but maybe not to that extreme but they improve these other risk factors i mean it's kind of a toss-up we don't really know what the net effect is but all else held equal removing the red meat uh, replacing it with with uh, other foods um I don't know, legumes, whatever, um, replacing it with other um, healthy foods would likely lower risk. And you know, reducing your LDL cholesterol or ApoB would likely lower risk. And mm -hmm. so that's sort of the issue here is, again, he's sort of painting it as though I'm taking this bizarrely absolutist sort of position or extremist position when that's not the case. Just watch any of Matthew's content. It's not sensational. It's it's very particular. You sound like a scientist when you're speaking, a very objective one. That's one of the reasons I like your content so much. I don't know. It, it, he clearly, at least in my opinion, doesn't seem like he's familiar with the kind of content you make. No, but it sounds it sounds like he saw my debate with Chafee, or at least knows about it, because he mentioned mm -hmm. it at the beginning. And I think I was pretty measured in that too. Like they tried yeah. to get me to take the position that a vegan diet is above all else, the best thing ever. And I wouldn't. Yeah. I actually refused to take that. Like so. If he had seen that, I don't know why he's making these sorts of assumptions, but maybe mm -hmm. he just knows that it happened and didn't actually see it. I don't know. Yeah, uh, who knows? Anyway, so I find this criticism to be at best a joke. You know, you know, let me just. 
I mean, okay. <laughs> Point out, if Dr. Niagara is saying we know something with 100% certainty, please clarify. I'm not that. saying that. Yeah, I don't know. I am not. Yeah. Okay, but anyways, keep going. We don't have to keep stopping it. Yeah. That is. And tell me you will stand by that no matter what happens to any person on the planet. And they are, they are, they are, they are welcome to sue you or to take any sort of action against you if for some reason they have a bad outcome. If you're willing to say that, I'd love to hear it. You're not. All right. You guys take yes, care. I'm not. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Yeah. And, okay. and something else to just mention, I, I think going back to the the 50 year RCT thing, I can't remember, I mean, we've recorded for a while now, I can't remember if I mentioned mm -hmm. this, but something I just wanna point out is even, we'll go further than just a 50 year RCT, let's say a lifelong metabolic ward twin study as, as some people suggest that we need for causal inference, which we don't have for anything. Um, but let's say you know, twins, they're locked up in separate chambers for their entire life. You have complete control over their dietary practices mm -hmm. and you can monitor them 24 seven um, and you follow them until death and you see if you know, one outcome is better than the other. Even in that case, we can't know the result with absolute certainty or mm -hmm. know the, the truth, I should say, with absolute certainty. We can make a reasonable inference based on that sort of uh, type of, of study. In fact, uh, we, can, we can be quite confident in the result, but it's not 100%. That is something that, that these people just don't seem to understand. All we're doing with research is we're, we're assessing the probability of various outcomes or a link between a, an exposure and an outcome and making an inference based on the totality of the evidence. That's really it. And the degree of certainty we have for different outcomes is different. Um, obviously, it'll vary a bit, uh, but we're just trying to get closer to the truth. We're not trying to like, determine the objective truth. So, And mm -hmm. even in that case, you can't technically like uh, identify the objective truth. So yeah. uh, I just want to make that very, very clear that even in that case, you wouldn't use the type of language typically that, that he's kind of presenting yeah and you were never asking for that level of certainty yeah, exactly. anyway so yeah, exactly um anyway I, well i'm actually just curious have you ever reached out to him for like a discussion or anything like that a debate whatever uh definitely in like comments and things like that but actually so for one yes i would be willing to debate him uh, the only things i would ask that we share references in advance which i know he's willing to do because he did that with garth i think a, a couple things might have come up during the debate that weren't shared ahead but i know uh, yep. the vast majority was so that should be no problem um and then second is that we just hone in on a specific topic so like red mm -hmm. meat and cardiovascular disease and we can work together to refine it down if we want to look at like a specific dose threshold or a specific replacement mm -hmm. food or whatever and but but I, i'd want to focus on a specific topic because if it's just two guys go at it yeah that's going to last several hours i've done that before and it's, it's gotcha. just, i'd rather just just have more focus now as far as have we gotten anywhere? Well, about a month and a half, two months ago, something like that, uh, someone reached out to me. They have a podcast. I think a lot of people watching this will know who they are. Um, and they said that Sean was planning to come on their show and was willing to debate someone on the other side. And they wanted to know if I would do it. I said yes. And this would have been in person. So we just had to organize uh, dates because obviously you got to fly into location. There's you know logistical concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and so I provided a couple windows of dates that would potentially work for me. Um, I'd have to, if we were to move forward, I'd have to rework that now just because uh, it's been so long. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. but uh, anyways, um, I provided dates and they were going to pass them on to Sean and see if we can figure something out. And I never heard back. I actually checked mm. in uh, with them again recently and I still haven't heard back. Uh, I'm sure mm. I will soon. But um, I don't know if that's if, if Sean didn't receive that info or if he's not willing to or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But yes, I'm willing to. Yes, it's been worked on. And if Sean wants to move forward with that, I'm sure he knows who I'm talking about and he can you know follow up with them and we can organize it. OK, great. Yeah, I mean, hopefully he can uh, see this and maybe that'll facilitate the exchange. Well, I guess that is the end of the video. Everybody go follow Matthew on Instagram. He's on Twitter as well, but I think Instagram is where you're uh, the most active. I will have, I'll have, I mean, I'll just put all your links in the, in the description for people to uh, find you. Uh, but anything else to say before we end this? No, I think that's good. I think that, I mean, I don't know how long that took, like an hour to yeah, respond it's to gonna seven be a bit. minutes or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, hopefully that's useful. I think we covered a lot of, a lot of ground, maybe gave people some stuff to think about. So, yeah. um, maybe gave Sean some stuff to think about. So cool. Um, yeah. I think that's good. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on and to everyone watching, I will see you in the next video. Dude, fuck off, I don't saying. want anything to do with you. Don't ever speak to me again, you're a fucking piece of shit. Even vegans don't get your weird, stupid
stupid wannabe sense of irony here. Who is your audience? Nobody gets these dumb jokes. Dude, 